Pushkin. Hey, it's Justin Richmond. Today on the show, we have Grammy Award winning singer songwriter Lyle Lovett. Lovett follows in the footsteps of Texas troubadours like Gary Clark, Walter Hyatt, and my personal favorite Texan of all time, Towns Van Zandt. In 1986, he laid the foundation for alternative country and Americana movements with his debut self titled album. The album shot up to number 14 on the Billboard country charts, and the rest, as they say, is history. Since that time, Lovett has continued to light up country music with a rich blend of country, big band, blues, folk, and jazz. All of those sounds are on display in 12th of June, his first new album in a decade. On today's episode, Lovett speaks to Bruce Headlam about his new album, a project rooted in home and family, which makes sense considering his role as a newly minted dad to twins at 64. Lovett also shares stories of his early days playing gigs around Texas A&M University. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Bruce Headlam with Lyle Lovett. You have a new album. You're first in... Ten years, yeah. It would have been eight years had it not been for the pandemic. But uh, that was the idea. We cut tracks in November of 2019 with the idea of finishing in March maybe into April of 2020. I did a tour from the end of January until the 7th of March. 7th of March was the last live date I played on that tour. It was the last live date I played until after the serious isolation. You've always had a heavy tour schedule. I assume that means you like touring. What was it like to just be forced off the road? It was, you know, anxious, and it was fraught with worry and figuring things out constantly. But the flip side of that was being home. I hadn't been that home that much, you know, since since I started. And I really enjoy that. You know, I like getting to be in the room with smart and talented people. And I've been fortunate to be blessed in that way my whole life and my career. And I get to work with some of the best and most known musicians in the world. And that's uplifting and inspiring. I miss my association with my friends, but I love being home. Now, are you the kind of writer who needs to write every day? I wish I were the kind of writer that needed to write every day or that could write every day. I lack the skills to approach it as a craft, I think. You know, my songs come more from feelings than they do from thought. And so that's something I think about. That's something I work towards still. But writing for me is not a thought about kind of thing. It's more of an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. So are you the kind that do you have a notebook with you all the time? I do not. No. When I was a boy, my parents both worked. And uh, I'd come home from school and have uh, three or four hours by myself at home. And I would watch afternoon TV. And one of the shows that I'd watch in the afternoon was the old Mike Douglas show. Mm-hmm. One time I saw Buck Owens on the Mike Douglas show. And, you know, years later I got to meet Buck. He was really sweet to me, really kind and funny and reminded me of my uncles, you know, kind of get, tease you and give you a hard time. Mike Douglas asked him that. Do you, well, how do you write songs? How do you? And Buck said, no, he said, I figure if it's good enough, I'll remember it. I just always thought of that. <laughs> and... and uh, so that's my excuse anyway. I blame it on Buck. It, it surprises me when you say all your songs come out of feelings, though, because I think most people would think of you as a pretty cerebral songwriter. There's a lot of wordplay. There's a lot of images. You know, if I had a boat, has that image of someone on a pony on a boat, which I think probably everybody who knows and loves that song keeps in their mind, it almost has a kind of Buster Keaton quality. I mean, my songwriting process, you know, it starts always with some sort of feeling and then thinking about how to express that and thinking about, you know, what am I trying to say here? I mean, it's always a puzzle and it's always a challenge. And I don't know how other writers approach writing, any kind of writing, but I always feel as though I'm lost and just trying to find my way through the darkness. Having the complete idea is the hardest part. And then writing words to that idea is still hard for me, but it's easier once you have something to write to. And when you say write to, does that mean like an image or a turn of phrase? 
an image or just what you want the song to ultimately say. What am I trying to communicate? Music's impact on us as people, in my opinion, is an emotional impact. It makes you feel something. You can take in a work of music and not have to hit the pause button on your life. You know, to stand in front of a painting, you have to stand still and look at it. To go to a film, you sit in a dark theater and you watch a film. To read a book, you stay in one place and you read. You can fix supper, you can drive somewhere, you can, you know, you can carry on with your life and listen to music. You can either listen to it intently, as though it's a film, as though it's a play, as though it's a, a book, or you can have it be background music, and it can still make you feel something. And the, the nicest compliment that I, I feel like I ever get paid is when they say, I remember exactly what I was doing the first time I heard that song. For me, when my song reminds somebody of his own life, his or her own life, I feel like that's the most I can ask for. So what were the feelings you were trying to capture going into this album? To answer your question the way you ask it would make it seem more deliberate than it is. I f feel somehow compelled to write about my feelings just for myself. And I evaluate later if what I've made up could be a song in my show or a song worth playing to somebody. And so in these last years, I mean, the thing that's been my life, the thing that's consumed my life gladly has been wanting to have a family and then having a family. My original songs are about family or are inspired by family and those kinds of close relationships that evolve over a person's life. These songs range from being in the moment, but also to looking back and talking about the shift in perspective from being a you know eighteen year old kid trying to play a gig anywhere he could to being a twenty eight year old recording act with his first album out, you know to being sixty four years old and trying to be relevant in my own time, I'm not trying to fit into what's going on currently, what's necessarily popular, but just trying to be accurate and trying to be where I am at this point in my life. You also, you look ahead in the song, June the 12th, which is your children's birthday, is that right? It, it is, yes. Okay. Looking ahead, wondering how long you're going to be there. I never considered my age, really, or d didn't think about it in the same way until they were born. I started doing the math. I thought, you know, gosh, I hope I can make it until they start school. I hope I can make it until they graduate from eighth grade or high school. You know, if I can see them go to college, wouldn't that be wonderful? If I see them get married, if I see them have children, wouldn't that be miraculous? And so I, I started, you know, thinking in those terms. I don't know if the best description is their songs about knowing you're out of love or just incompatibility or fate. You've got some beautiful songs in that vein on this album I'd like you to talk about, which is uh, the first is The Mocking Ones. Thank you. Once again, it's a kind of an age perspective in that uh, when you're younger, you imagine being close always to people you're close to. And you know, it doesn't necessarily work out that way. I mean, you just don't stay close to everyone you'd like to stay close to. So it's really a song about friendship, and it's a song about lives growing apart, and how, you know, when you might run into somebody that you knew from who was important to you from before, it affects you. Mm -hmm. How does it affect you? It's mixed, isn't it? In a way, it it's a wonderful bringing of that time back immediately. And it also brings up a feeling of loss. And ultimately, in that song, resolves in, hey, it's great to see you. Let's hear Lyle Lovett play his new song, The Mocking Ones, from the album 12th of June. 
We're back with Bruce Hedlum's conversation with Lyle Lovett. You mentioned growing up, coming home, your parents both working. Was there music in your house growing up? My parents subscribed to the old Columbia Record Club, and Mm -hmm. they'd get a new album every month. And they were really nice about letting me play their records when they were away from home. And I was very particular about them anyway. So I listened to their records a lot. And there was quite a variety of artists that the record club would send them. And And they would buy records, too. Their record collection had country records. I remember a great sampler record with Carl Smith and Lefty Frizzell. You know, they had Ray Charles records, they had Ray Price records, Mm -hmm. they had Nat King Cole records, Perry Como records, they had Glenn Miller records. And uh, growing up in a city like Houston, a cosmopolitan uh, place, radio was well represented, pop radio, country radio. I would go from channel to channel and listen to all kinds of music. I wanted to ask you about Nat King Cole because you cover two songs of his, two songs he made famous on this album. And in fact, two songs he recorded in the same session, I think. I I didn't know that. Yeah, in the same session he recorded Straighten Up and Fly Right, which he wrote, and uh, G-Baby, Ain't I Good to You. I was just a boy when his television show was on the air, and I used to love watching him. He was such an elegant host and so gracious with his guests. Both of those songs, I wouldn't have thought to approach. But in 1993, Matt Rawlings, who has played piano and keyboards with me from the very beginning, Matt was doing a solo, his first solo record for the MCA Master Series, which was an instrumental label that MCA Nashville was doing. And uh, Matt asked me if I would sing G-Baby Ain't I Good To You with him. And it was more about the piano, and there were extended piano breaks, and it was, his playing was brilliant, as always. You know, it was a really fun session. David Hungate played guitar. A few years later, Gary Marshall asked me to record Straighten Up and Fly Right for his film Dear God. And so I got the guys together, and we recorded that. Getting a specific request from someone else I always uh, felt gave me permission to do a song that I would otherwise maybe have just learned and played on the edge of my bed in my bedroom for the fun of it. Approaching a classic where there's absolutely no reason for my version of it to exist except that someone like Gary Marshall or like Matt Rawlings has asked me to do it, that's reason enough to say yes. And it's great fun to sing a great song like that, to sing a standard, to sing a classic, beautifully written song like that. It's like being in the greatest garage band in the world. So we we recorded those songs then and would occasionally play them. They became part of the set list. And in the last few years, as a way to feature Francine Reed, who I've sung with since 1984, we made duets out of G-Baby Anna Good to You and Straighten Up and Fly Right. And so the last few tours we've done those live, our versions of the songs developed into something that seemed unique to the large band. After, you know, an eight or ten year break, I wanted this album to, in a way, be an overview. I wanted it to represent the different styles that I've worked in over the years and kind of represent the spectrum of things that somebody might expect to hear if they come to see me live. I thought those arrangements would represent the large band That's why I picked those to be on the record. If those songs hadn't become part of my work over the years, I probably wouldn't have just selected them out of thin air. We're talking about your large band songs, which is, you know, one of the buckets of the kind of why I love it repertoire. Do you put any of your own songs up with those songs like Straighten Up and Fly Right and G-Baby? In terms of arrangement, yes. You know, we arranged one of my songs, Pants is Overrated, with the horn section and the vocal group. So I think of that as a large band arrangement on this album. But I didn't have other songs that I felt would represent the band as well to record on this record. And because we'd been playing G-Baby and I Go To You and Straight Up and Fly Right live the last couple of tours, I wanted to be on the record so people who had heard them live 
would have recordings of them. I guess I'm looking back over your career. I'm thinking there are songs of yours, She's No Lady, That's Right, that have kind of entered the consciousness, that sort of American songbook river. Well, that's nice you to say. The idea of the large band really came about because of one generous, supportive, consistently involved person, Billy Williams from Phoenix, Arizona. Billy was the music director for J. David Sloan and the Rogues. J. J. David Sloan was the lead singer and is a wonderful man and a wonderful singer. He and Billy were about the same age. I met them in 1983 in Luxembourg. My friend Claude Weber, who was a country music fan, and his stage name was Buffalo Wayne. He said he named himself after his two favorite American cowboy heroes, Buffalo Bill and John Wayne. My friend Claude, he had something to do with the city fair in Luxembourg called the Schuberfuhr. And he asked me if I wanted to play between sets of the two main bands that were playing this American music tent at the Schuberfuhr. One band was a top 40 cover band from Orlando that billed itself as a Las Vegas show band, and they, they were called Body and Soul. I still know some of those folks as well. And the other band was J. David Sloan and the Rogues, who were the house band at the just most happening country music nightclub in Phoenix, a place called Mr. Lucky's. For years and years, they were the house band. Billy Williams was originally from Michigan and then ended up in Phoenix, but he would produce demos for Buddy Cannon, started working with J. David Sloan, who he knew already, and they would look for talented musicians in the area, and they were the swingingest, jazziest country band that I'd ever heard. Matt Rawlings would play a solo on a country song, and I'd think, my goodness, I've never heard anything like that before in my life. Meeting up with them at the Schuber Fuhr was, you know, serendipitous, to say the least, but what made it so important was that we were there together for a month, playing five nights a week. My first day there, first time I played, I could see that my performance was unnecessary and superfluous. I, I played the set change between the two bands. And I wasn't, they didn't even set me up on stage. I was on the little dance floor in front of the stage while they changed the stage. People that came to this event, because of J. David Sloan and the Rogues being an American country band, you know, would come in their best cowboy stuff or best facsimile cowboy stuff. Kind of messed up hats and cowboy clothes and some wearing woolly shaps with saddle oxfords instead of boots, that sort of thing. The event was sponsored by Cargo Airline. And my friend Claude designed a poster of a cowgirl with Cisco Kid kind of gun belts Right. crisscrossed across mm -hmm. her bare breasts. Didn't go over great with Cargo Lux. <laughs> Claude was di dismissed. And as a result, I was also, you know, on the bubble. Claude spoke up for me, and they kept me on the gig. My pay at that point had been a one-way ticket to Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. I went to J. David Sloan and to Billy Williams, and I said, yeah, I'm a little worried about this, you know. I'm, I really, I'm playing this gig for airfare, and, and I'm a little worried that I might not get my return ticket, and I, that would be important to me. And they said, we'll learn some of your songs, and why don't you sit in with us during our sets every night, and, you know, that way you will have worked and they'll have to pay you. So that's what we did. J. David and Billy negotiated my take it home. And at the end of that month, they said, if you ever want to do any recording, come out here to Phoenix, and we'll, we'll give you the first day in the studio for free. And so in early June of 1984, I called Billy, and I said, hey, is your offer still good? Can I come out? And he said, sure, come on out. He booked his time at a, at a really nice little studio in Scottsdale, Arizona, in the backyard of Ed and Marie Ravenscroft. They called their place Chaton Recordings, and an engineer named Steve Moore recorded us to a 24-track analog, two-inch tape, 
And we recorded four songs that first day, complete with harmony vocals and Billy overdubbing uh, solos with his guitar, his Les Paul plugged straight into the board. And those four songs were the first four songs that I took with me on my first trip to Nashville a couple weeks later. What were those songs? They were If I Were the Man You Wanted, Cowboy Man, Closing Time, and Give Back My Heart. Well, those are some pretty good songs. Well, thank you. Thank you. And and recording with that band was just a revelation to me. I loved their playing and I loved their take on well, just their feel and I, I was just grateful that they would let me play with them. We're back with the rest of Bruce's conversation with Lyle Lovett, starting with how Lovett got his start in the music business. My dad's boss in 1984 was a man named Mr. Bress, Joe Bress, and his son liked the idea of being in the music business, so he went to school at Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to really get into the business. Dad knew that and talked to Mr. Bress, and we called his son, Bo, and Bo said, hey, I'll make, I'll make some calls for you. He said, are you affiliated with either of the performing rights organizations? And I said, well, I'm, I joined ASCAP six years ago or so when I started copywriting my songs. I joined ASCAP. I'm a member of ASCAP. He said, well, he said, let me call ASCAP for you, set you up a meeting with a membership rep. And I said, do you think they do it? He said, well, that's what they do. It's their job to talk to their songwriters. That was my first meeting with a man named Merlin Littlefield. He was just enthusiasm personified and started making calls for me and set up meetings for me all over town that week. And Jim Rooney, uh, if you know about Jim, is just an amazing, incredible human being on the planet. I think he's 82 now, lives up in Vermont. He was part of the, the whole Cambridge folk scene and part of the the New York folk scene in those days used to play music with Bill Keith. He's, you know, written books and he's, you know, deep and just, you know, makes the world a better place. He would let me sleep on his couch when I'd come to Nashville. You know, in those days, I'd I'd go to Nashville every four to five to six weeks and uh, make the rounds again. He'd say, yeah, if you need a place to stay, come over here. And so I took him up on that occasionally. He was Emotionally supportive and uh, saved me some money. Were you writing songs? I always try to be th- working on something. We're still playing the same eight places once every couple of months. You know, that's sort of my usual rotation. Not making enough money to make a legitimate living as an adult. And so and I was living back at home, you know, in my room with, at my parents' house. Jim Rooney helped me and ultimately took me over. He said, you know, the, he said, you, have you met any of the folks over at Criterion Music? And I said, no, I haven't. And he took me to Criterion's Nashville office on 17th Avenue, met the guy that was running. His name was Ted. Criterion shared an office with Rodney Crowell and Roseanne Cash. And uh, I met Rodney and Roseanne at that same, same meeting. And I was thrilled, you know, to meet them. Ted listened to my tape and he said, well, I'll send it. He said, our headquarters are out in Los Angeles. I'll send it out there to them. And I thanked him and that was it and didn't hear anything from him. That was in February of 1985. In July of 1985, I got a phone call. And the person said, this is Bo Golson from Criterion Music. Ted in Nashville just sent me your tape. And I just listened to it. Would you like a publishing deal? Like that. Now, every publisher I'd talked to to, up to that point was encouraging to me, but no one had said, would you like a publishing deal? Would you like to write for us? People said things like, gosh, you know, I like this personally, but I just don't know what we'd do with it. Nobody expressed any kind of commitment until Bo Goldson. And Bo said that in the, you know, before I even said hello back. And, and And he added... If you sign with us, I think we have a record deal for you. And I said, really? I said, with who? He said, sign with us and I'll tell you. (laughs) (laughs) So he he invited me to come out to Los Angeles to see their offices out there and to meet him. I went and he couldn't have been nicer. And they had an incredible catalog. I mean, they 
They owned all of Charlie Parker's stuff. Lee Hazelwood was one of their writers. Rodney Crowell had been one of their writers. Uh, Tom Kimmel was one of their writers. I just couldn't believe the titles that they had. At that point, did you still think you were going to be a performer, or did you want to write for other people? I enjoyed performing, and I had no intention of stopping performing, but I didn't have any expectation of performing beyond the gigs that I was already doing, you know, playing to places that held 75 or 100 people. Now, before you did that, you were at Texas A&M. That's true. And you met a lot of your songwriting heroes writing for the paper there. I did. Were you really interviewing them? Were you just hitting them up for ideas? I started playing out when I was 18. So by the time I got into the school of journalism, my main focus was performing. I didn't think performing was a realistic expectation for my life. Going to school was important to me because it was important to my parents. I've always been close to my parents and have always, in any situation I've ever been in, if my parents would show up, I would always feel better. That's how supportive they always were. They were giving me the chance to do things they didn't get to do. That all seemed clear to me. You know, halfway through, when I'd gotten my prerequisites out of the way, I, I stopped thinking about, well, what do I want to study? What do I want a degree in? And I started thinking, what can I get a degree in? And I'd always done well on paper, so I thought, let me just check into this. And when I got to the College of Journalism, when I went and met professors there and looked around and saw the students working at our daily paper, the battalion, they were as, as interested in writing and in getting that paper out and, and publishing as I was in booking my next gig. It was an electric atmosphere, and I was drawn to it immediately. I was on the city desk. I went to every city council meeting for a year and a half and enjoyed learning about the local politics, enjoyed getting to know the councilmen. But entertainment stories, we would kind of draw straws. for The entertainment stories were fun to do, you know, to be able to talk to, to artists. I always put my name in the hat for the kinds of performers that I like to go in and hear. And, and often got to write about them. I mean, it was certainly personally enriching. And I was, I was just honored and excited to be in the room talking to somebody I was a fan of. But my objective in writing those stories was to, you know, to spread the gospel of Nancy Griffith, of Eric Taylor, of Don Sanders, of Stephen Fromholtz, or Michael Martin Murphy. And, but although Murphy was, was really well known and was a, you know, a big hit in those days. He, he did a concert in 1975 at Texas A&M that I attended that was just pivotal in my growing up because he had a number one pop hit on the radio at that time, Wildfire. I mean, pop hit. And there he was, filled up the basketball arena, and he did a two-hour show, the first hour of which was him and his guitar. And he had you know, 7,000 people at G. Riley White Coliseum just made it seem like he was in a room of 100 people. It was so quiet and such an intimate performance. And I saw the, the power of that, and I just thought, wouldn't that be amazing to do something like that? And when had you started playing guitar? I'm embarrassed to admit this, but uh, I've started taking guitar lessons in second grade. I'm not a guitar player. I, I play well enough to accompany my songs, but nobody would hire me to play guitar in their band, you know. But I, uh, I always loved playing, and my guitar teacher uh, in those days was a, a man named Chuck Woods, who was a session player around Houston. Our lessons were, were exercises in enjoyment, really. He taught me to read treble clef taught me to count. Sometimes I would practice a little bit during the week, and other times I wouldn't practice at all. But I always looked forward to that, uh, that Monday night and later Thursday night lessons with him. Guitar was something in my life that it was just, just always a positive. It was always something that I enjoyed. I don't feel like I'm really a competitive kind of person, so I didn't really have any kind of, you know, anybody to, to play guitar with in school. Did he teach you finger-picking? 
a little bit, but my my finger picking came from in my high school years. I took lessons at H and H Music Company on Caroline Street in downtown Houston. My buddy Bruce Lyon, uh, who was a year older than I in in high school and had his driver's license a year ahead of me, he would drive us in those days to our lesson. And Freddie was his teacher. That's how I met Freddie. Freddie was a graduate student at the University of Houston. He had this gorgeous red Gibson ES355 stereo guitar, and they played through a Fender amp. And Freddie loved Chet Atkins. We learned Chet arrangements of songs. He taught me how to alternate my thumb. So I owe that to Fred Foss. And then listening to Texas singer-songwriters like Murphy. If you listen to Murphy's first album in particular, with a song like Boy from the Country, it's all about alternating that thumb. I ask because there's something very distinctive about your finger-picking on some songs. I must not be the only one who thinks this, because if you go on YouTube, there are about a thousand instructional videos to play If I Had a Boat. To me, it's very distinct. Skinny Legs is another one that has that sound. You know, typically with finger picking, you know, people get the bass going and then they add a little. Right off the top, particularly on If I Had a Boat, it's full of notes. You've got like 16 notes right at the top (laughs) of that. And not many people play that way. It's very very distinctive. Well, thank you. It's not unique and it's not even that unusual. John Hyatt and I are friends and have worked together for years doing song swap kinds of shows and sometimes John will throw in one of those forward roles just to go hey I'm, I'm, I'm on to you I know what you're doing and one of his songs <laughs> and, and, uh, which I, he gives, he'll give me a grin but that style alternating bass that style of finger picking was prevalent among songwriters I would hear around Houston like Eric Taylor like Nancy Griffith like Don Sanders like Vince Bell because the performers I was drawn to were playing original music clubs, and they usually playing solo. That kind of finger-picking, that, those kinds of arrangements were a way to, to have kind of a complete accompaniment you know, without having to have a band. You know, there was something complete about that style of playing to my ear as I saw other people do it. That's why I did it. You know, you can express the song with just your guitar. But now you're playing, it, it's a little bit like you're singing in a way. When I listen to you, you're very forward in the pocket the way you sing. Even when you sing blues, like on, you know, My Baby Don't Tolerate, it's one. It's, it's a big bluesy album of yours. But you're very at the top of each bar, I think. Do you think? I think. Maybe because I worry about laying it back too much. Mm-hmm. I, I do think about that. I, I do you know, find that in the... In the uh, toward the end of the phrases, sometimes I'll I, you know, I'm tr- I try not to lay it back too much. We're talking to Paul Simon. You know, he talked about when he was singing with Garfunkel, everything was very upfront, and when he became a, a solo artist, and he really had to to rethink. He, he found himself moving further and further back in the pocket, mm-hmm. and you know he's he's got that now. I've had the good fortune of being around Paul Simon a few times. I, you know, I wouldn't say we're you know I know I know him well, but I've gotten to be part of some special events with him and I know Edie and and uh, he's such a lovely you know brilliant person gosh you know what a wonderful combination of feeling and thinking the impact of his music feels purely emotional but then you know it, it's all thought out I mean not, <laughs> there's not a word or a note that hasn't been considered there's so much going on in those songs. They're beautiful albums to listen to. Amen. Back in the old days, you know, uh, and I made my first demos and and really only my first record did we mix on an analog board. But mixes were as much of a performance as tracking was. Sometimes you'd have three or four people on a board making their moves at the right time. And the question at the end of a mix wasn't, well, shall we mix it again? It was always, well, you think we can beat that one? I mean, it was a performance. Well, now mixing isn't like that because everything's automated. You can recall mixes 10 back if you want to and go back to something if you feel like you've gotten away from what was good. The ability to be detailed is endless. And artists like Paul Simon are. They realize everything is important. Every sound has 
and impact. How detailed are you in the studio? I, I'm detailed. I, my mom, her last secretarial job was in the publications department at Exxon, which, which is really part of the reason that I was interested in journalism. The publications department would allow my mom to check out cameras. I ended up kind of writing for a local motorcycle publication. The art director for Exxon Publications was a really sweet man named Richard Payne. He agreed. I asked him if he would paint a helmet for me because all the, you know, how you looked was almost as important as how fast you went. He drew up several designs, which I rejected. And then finally he came up with a design that I liked. And he scrawled a note across the, his drawing of it. And he said, Burnell, that's my mom's name, Burnell, see if this does anything for that picky kid. Now, I was 13, you know, I'm 13. I have that framed in my office. You know, I've been accused of being, I don't think I'm picky. I just want to get things the way they sound good to me. But, you know, I've been fortunate to work with generous people in my life that tolerate my preferences and, and help me, you know, ultimately just help me get something to, to where I like it. You know, Tony Brown, Billy Williams, and Chuck Ainley, who engineered the large band record, and uh, George Massenberg and Nathaniel Kunkel, who I met together uh, in 1991 to record Joshua Joe's Ruth, and then recorded everything since that with Nathaniel Kunkel. Before we get off the subject of that great wave of Texas songwriters, I want to talk to you more about how they influenced you. I do want to ask you about one, and that's uh, Willis Allen Ramsey, who's this sort of singular figure, maybe because he put out one album. But can you tell me a bit about about him and your relationship with him? I've discovered his first record uh, through my friend Bruce Lyon. Gosh, it was 1974, and bought it and just you know immediately started trying to learn every song on it. The thing that really drew me into Willis, besides his melody and use of language, was his blues influence. All of those songs, you you hear blues in in all of them. And I I loved his voice, and I, I just thought, gosh, this is amazing. I mean, this is old blues and new music. Could you, just a couple bars of a Willis Allen Ramsey song? Sure, yeah, sure. Willis is a major influence on me. I got to know Willis personally, and he's you know one of my closest friends. I just admire his. Uh, he's now talk about detail. Willis is. Uh, I'm convinced that Willis Allen Ramsey can hear things that I can't hear. He, per- he perceives things sonically that uh, other people are imperceptible. I got to interview him in 1979 because the basement had booked me to open for him, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll ask the battalion if I can write about it, and they said yes. And so I'm interviewing him in between sets, and I asked him in 1979 the obvious question. The first thing I said to him was, when? You know, meaning the second album. And <laughs> I asked him a one-word question, when? He gave me a one-word answer. He said, soon. And that was in 1979. I asked a friend of mine who teaches journalism in Austin now, what is your most Texas song? And he said, this old porch. Ah, very nice. And which, is a, which was a, a, you know, a collaboration, which was a, a, an unintended co-write with my friend Robert O'Keefe. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and he said Robert enjoys saying son of a bitch a little more than you do in that song. And I, and I put it in. And, oh, is that right? That's, yeah. Hey, Robert, it was the, the spring of 1980, and, and Robert and I had stretched our undergraduate careers as long as we could at Texas A&M. Robert was class of 78. I was class of 79. We graduated in August of 1980. On the same day, we were two of just a few students from the College of Liberal Arts who graduated that day. His name started with a K, mine with an L. We sat right next to each other. It was it was perfect, but we were both thinking, well, what are we going to do? You know, neither one of us had been interviewing for jobs. We wanted to play music, and Robert played for me that spring a new song, and it was the first three verses of what he called the front porch song, 
and it was you know a different tempo than I play it. And it had some spoken word connections between the verses, which suited Robert's personality great. And I said, well, I want to learn that right now. Teach it to me. So he did. And I went back to my apartment and kept, you know, played it and played it and played it. And I started thinking to myself, Robert painted these beautiful pictures of places that we would go to, of places we loved, and places we would miss. But he left himself out of the song. And Robert had a wonderful relationship with his landlord, a man named Jack Boyette, who was in his 70s. He seemed ancient, but he was just in his 70s. And that area of town had been the Boyette family farm years before and been sold off, subdivided, a dilapidated old farmhouse with a front porch that was always in need of propping up. And Robert and his roommate, Brian Duckworth, were always working on it, and we'd all help, and it was just the place where we all hung out. I learned Robert's song, played it over and over, and I started thinking about the tenderness Robert showed to Mr. Boyette, who was regarded by his other tenants as being a slumlord and insensitive. And and one thing that Mr. Boyette was sort of famous for was he would just walk into those rent houses as though they were his, as though somebody else wasn't living there. And most of his tenants, I mean, some people moved out. Most of his tenants were, you know, upset by that. And Robert, when Mr. Boyette would just walk in the front door and walk into the kitchen and look into the refrigerator and say, hey, Mr. Boyette, come on in. And I just always admired Robert's relationship with him. I admired how Robert looked out for Mr. Boyette, how he would go down to his Mr. Boyette's farm place in Millican, Texas, and help him with his cows and help him patch the fence and just whatever he needed to do or go to lunch with Mr. Boyette. And so I started thinking about that, and I wrote the last three verses of that song and then went to Robert and said, look, I'm not trying to meddle, but can I play this for you? And he was really, really meant a lot to me. He said, oh, I love that. Let's, let's keep it. We didn't really write the song together. We wrote it separately and in two parts. And and I played it the way I play it. And I left out Robert's spoken word parts because I thought those were should be unique to him. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that he had spoken word parts that you say sort of connected some of the images. Yes. You know, a lot of your writing, I think of back then, as being very impressionistic. Don't spell everything out. Leave room for people to connect the dots themselves. Don't tell them how to connect the dots. That kind of writing appeals to me. Is it something where you have the idea and then you strip away the connections, or does it come out of the language? I think it's more fun to drop breadcrumbs than it is to pave the path. So a song like Pontiac, for example. Yes. Did that start with a character, or did that... It did start with a character. Was that something you observed? Before everybody became a songwriter, people sometimes would suggest topics to write about. And uh, my girlfriend at the time said, you know what you should write a song about. And I'm, you know, my first thought was, yes, anything except for what, what you're about to yeah. say. <laughs> 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 and and she, she told me, and where she lived, and there was a there was an art gallery next door, and she said, "There's a, you know, there's a man that parks here every afternoon." He says, "You should go talk to him," and so I, you know, paid attention, and sure enough, he had one of those old kind of faded GM blue that that they had in those in those days. This was in the mid '80s, and uh, I can't I can't remember if it was a Bonneville or a, but what it was a, it was a sedan. He would open the door and jack his leg out the side, and he would smoke a cigarette, and there would be a can of Coke on the dashboard. And he would, it was just kind of on a hill that went down to Shoal Creek in Austin. And I thought, I don't want to talk to him. I, it's like, it seemed like such a ritual to him that I wouldn't want to disturb it. I just imagined what his story might be. But the the idea was you just don't know everything that's behind that face that you're seeing. 
it's an experience that's common to all of us. That's why in the music video, it was the very first music video I ever did, I wanted to just have portraits of people in, in a way to say, this story could belong to any of these people, or conversely, to say, the story that you're hearing about, each of these people have their own story as well. And, and I'm in the very last shot of that. And the record company just you know, had very little reaction to the video, <laughs> except uh, you, you're not in it. And I'd say, mm-hmm. well, yeah, I am there. There I am, right there. It's just at the very end. And I said, well, yeah. It's a song like a uh, simple song is the same way. There's no chorus to it. It goes right through. Was that something Guy Clark or another songwriter had done that you admired? It was just how it came out. Uh, and it was, you know, Simple Song was earlier. You know, I made up Simple Song, I think, when I was 18. I was a freshman, and we were studying, in English class, we were studying a five-paragraph paper. So I was, I thought, okay, I'm going to try to make up a five-verse song. You know, with the introductory verse, three verses in the body, and then a conclusion verse. That was simple song mm-hmm. but but i i don't i i didn't feel as though songs needed you know necessarily needed a chorus funny thinking about that album maybe one of the most conventional songs is la county which is actually the most violent song right but it has the most um immediately grasped kind of feel and structure it's a story song, and you've got the chorus, but it's got the most surprising ending. And musically, but but musically, it's re- really unconventional in that, you know, there, there there are only two chords in the song. Playing that for the first time to Tony Brown, I he raised his eyebrows. He said, "Really, really? It's just two chords." It's just two chords. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Well, let's just try it. Let's try it." And so he was very supportive of it. All right, I've taken up an enormous amount of your time, but it's been. Hugely enjoyed. Yeah, I'm sorry I talk so much. We're not using tape anymore, so it's not like we're, we're seeing the real. Thanks to Lyle Lovett for coming on Broken Record to talk about his life, career, and new album. You can hear all of our favorite Lyle Lovett songs on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez, with engineering help from Nick Chafee. Our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you like this show and others from Pushkin, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted ad-free listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. <laughs>